For sermon reflection today, I'm going to draw on the Gospel of John, verses, uh, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. The passage we will spend time with today, taken from the Gospel according to John, is very timely. Not only as a part of the lectionary readings for this Sunday in the liturgical year, but now, in our time, in the midst of a time that feels uncertain to so many all at once. This is what happens when we as followers of the Word read and learn from Scripture as if we have a kind of split vision or insight. Not the kind of split vision that distorts, as I had experienced earlier in the year when my optic nerve caused my eyes to distort what I was actually seeing right in front of me. By the way, my sight has cleared up and I can report that I'm seeing things very clearly again. But rather, more like experiencing the reality of two frames of reference in our life at the same time that shed light on each other. So as I read through this passage with you, after each few verses, I will pause and reflect some thoughts and insights that I have. Perhaps you may take the time, after the video worship, to pause in your schedule to practice the same kind of study, discerning and prayer, by pondering and adding your thoughts as you reread the scripture. These world-impacting events of crucifixion, resurrection, and COVID-19, while very different, may cause us to hear and experience the movement of the Holy Spirit, God's presence in our life in some ways that affirm us, affirm for us God's faithfulness through all time and the truth of Jesus' reality and the life-infusing gifts of the Holy Spirit planted in each one of us as God's children. The passage begins, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now remember the chronology here. The resurrection had taken place on the morning of the third day. And now this passage tells us it is the evening of that first day. Isn't it interesting that the disciples were still hiding behind locked doors in fear? I'm sure we can empathize with them. A lot happened in a very short time frame, and emotions are always powerful drivers of our all too human responses and reactions. For the disciples, the high of a tri triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Jesus, trying to keep up with the compacted, intense teaching by Jesus in the days following that entry. The devastating, crushing blow of crucifixion, the wrenching grief, questioning what is true anymore, and what will they do now that they have given up everything for Jesus? The surreal and ecstatic news of resurrection by the women, and then this hurried gathering of the disciples and closest friends, Yes, behind closed doors. The world wasn't safe anymore. For us today, a new year begins with all kinds of energizing images of 2020 vision for new things to come. And then some strange local virus beginning to spread like wildfire, uncontrollable, beyond the grasp of even the wisest medical minds of the world. Then isolation, shutdown, pandemic quarantine. 
closures of work and businesses and churches and, and all gatherings stopped. Travel bans enacted. Food and supplies panic buying. Health and safety equipment and hygiene supplies unavailable. Death, quarantine, and more death. Housebound. Maybe not behind closed doors or locked doors, but fear and questions abounding. When will this end? And into the middle of all of this, Jesus appears. What are his first words? Peace be with you. Now Jesus knows our greatest need. Even before we admit it, Jesus knows the human heart needs the assurance of a peace beyond our capacity to create, beyond our capacity to create, or conjure up, or even imagine, because our brain gets overwhelmed with fear, questions, and every possible what-if scenario that we can come up with. We leave little or no space for peace. Peace calmness, focused attention on the things that we have already been told and taught, these are the things Jesus speaks into reality in our lives. And the passage continues. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Again, the peace being spoken into us. And Jesus says, I have something for you to do. Apparently, sitting locked away in our questions, worries, and fears is so self-defeating that we need something to do, something to take our minds off of ourselves, something that will refocus us on the vital life-giving realities of relational interaction that we can't engage in right now. Then Jesus equipped them, the disciples, both then and now, that includes us, with the gift of the Holy Spirit, enabling us beyond our capacity to do that which we are being sent to do. And that, what would that doing be? Apparently, we are being sent out to release others from bondage, to speak to the things that bind human beings from being the people that God created us to be in the beginning. Sin binds us up. It shuts us down. It limits our sight to see and our freedom to live in the fullness of life granted by God. We are granted the power by Jesus to do this. We are also given the choice of whether or not we will. So, immediately following this gift given and this uh, sending us out, we are immediately shown a living example of how this can play out. The scripture continues. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. They did. They told the good news to someone who had not heard it. Yay, that's what we want to see happen when we talk about being sent out by God's commission. In effect, they were overjoyed. They didn't have to worry anymore. We have seen the Lord. The scripture continues. But he, Thomas, said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
And so the disciples were shut down immediately by Thomas. He couldn't believe it. It wasn't possible. Can you imagine someone saying these things to you? We know Jesus is alive. We've seen him. How do we respond when we're questioned if we're telling that message to the world? Thomas is thinking, what do you mean? Is this some kind of hoax? I, I, you guys have lost your mind. I'm not sure what's happened to you, but I would have to see for myself. Well, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And can you imagine? Thomas just stands there in awe. Would he actually touch Jesus? Could he get over the actual reality of what was unfolding before him? He had been told, his friends gathered right there around him, having rejected him for his inability to believe the news that they had told him. Well, what about us? We've been told. We have even no moments of truth revealed. But this human frailty of putting our faith into action, admitting truth revealed, is hard for us. Why do we keep doubting? Why do we default to fear and questions? Why can't we stand strong to trust and believe, as the old hymn says? Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. There it is. He said it. He knew it. Not only because he saw it, but because he had been told it, and it was confirmed by the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I heard a story by a friend this week, and I asked her if I could tell her story. She's a dear friend of our family, a frontline worker as a nurse. She told me that she feels the tension and the worry every day as she goes into work, and they test to make sure she doesn't have symptoms or any fever. And yet, as she goes in, she chooses to trust and put her faith in God into every day. One of her colleagues asked her the other day, how can you believe in God in the middle of this turmoil? And her response was, it is because of this that I believe and trust in God's grace. See, her affirmation of her faith touched her colleague, and he had further questions and conversations throughout the day with her. Her confident witness opened the door to an unbeliever, to one who would inquire, and she was willing and able to witness, to tell the story of her faith in Jesus. As I spoke to her and asked if I could tell this piece of her story, my response to his question was, how could you not believe? We have been told it has been revealed that these things will happen. It's throughout Scripture. We should not have to question. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not in, recorded in this book. You see, there is so much for us to hear and to read in Scripture. We need to read the story. We need to absorb it into our heart and our mind and our spirit. 
so that we will be prepared to tell it to others. We will be equipped to go as Jesus sends us. We may ask the question, why? But if you notice in this passage, the last verse tells us why. It answers the question why. Verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thanks be to God.